We'll be reading tonight the Lost Book of Inki here. Some, this is the introduction, some 445,000 years ago, astronauts from another planet came to Earth in search of gold. Splashing down in one of the Earth's seas, they waded ashore and established Iridu, home in the faraway. In time, the initial settlement expanded to a full-fledged mission Earth with a mission control center, a spaceport, mining operations, and even a way station on Mars. And there's, you know, there's lots of evidence of that. I mean, you know, there's, it, it, it absolutely is, no, to me, no coincidence and anybody wants to make you believe it's a coincidence is a liar, that the original area of what is now Iraq, formerly Mesopotamia, was called, before it was Mesopotamia, was called uh, oh, uh, Sidonia. Sorry, I had a brain fart there for a minute. And the area also on Mars where the face was found is also on Sidonia. Coincidentally enough, both places are also located on the 33rd degree parallel. Yes, you heard me right. Ancient Mesopotamia was or is also Iraq, also located on the 33rd degree parallel, uh, formerly known as Sidonia. Sidonia on Mars where the face is located is also on the 33rd degree parallel. As we talked about earlier with 33, no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen. So, you know, i got to say the idea of the way station thing, definitely, uh, definitely not evidence to support that. Short of manpower, the astronauts employed genetic engineering to fashion primitive workers, homo sa uh, horno sapiens. This is horno sapiens, so maybe that's a misprint. Homo sapiens, the deluge that cat catastrophically swept over the Earth required a fresh start. The astronauts became gods, granting mankind civilization, teaching it to worship. Then, about 4,000 years ago, all that had been achieved unraveled in a nuclear calamity brought about by the visitors to Earth in the course of their own rivalries and wars. Exactly what I talked about earlier. That's coincidental yet again. Uh, this is going to be a good read, I think. I can already tell. We're starting to see synchronicities already. Exactly what I described earlier with the Bhagavad Gita. The pre-flood ash. What had taken place on earth and especially the events since human history began has been culled by Zechariah Sitchin in his The Earth Chronicle series from the Bible, clay tablets, ancient myths, and archaeological discoveries. But what had preceded the events on earth, what had taken place on the astronauts' own planet Nibiru that caused the space journeys, the need for gold, the creation of man, what emotions, rivalries, beliefs, morals, or lack thereof motivated the principal players in the celestial and space sagas? What were the relationships that caused mounting tensions on Nibiru and on Earth? What tensions arose between old and young, between those who had come from Nibiru and those who uh, were born, born on Earth? And to what extent was what happened determined by destiny, a destiny whose record of past events holds the key to the future? Would it not be auspicious were one of the key players and eyewitness and one who could distinguish between fate and destiny to record for posterity the how and where and when and why of it all, the first things and perhaps the last things. But that is precisely what some of them did do, and foremost among them was the very leader who had commanded the first group of astronauts. Scholars and theologians alike now recognize that the biblical tales of creation, of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, the Deluge, the Tower of Babel, were based on texts written down millennia earlier in Mesopotamia. Now, keep in mind as well, folks, this is, again, why in 2003, in the invasion of Iraq, they went into the Iraq National Museum, stole all the artifacts pertaining to ancient Mesopotamia, the little reptilian alien statues, all the cylinder seals, all that stuff. This is why. And uh, the, uh, so the Adam, Adam, Adam and Eve, the Tales of Creation, the Garden of Eden, the Deluge, the Tower of Babel, were based on texts written down millennia earlier in Mesopotamia, especially by the Sumerians. And they, in turn, clearly stated that they obtained their knowledge of past events, many uh, from a time before civilizations began, even before mankind came to be, from the writings of the Anunnaki, from those from heaven to earth came the gods of antiquity. 
As a result of a century and a half of archaeological discoveries in the ruins of the ancient civilizations, especially in the Near East, a great number of such early texts have been found. The finds have also revealed the extent of missing texts, so-called lost books, which are either mentioned in discovered texts or are inferred from such texts, or that are known to have existed because they were cataloged in royal or temple libraries. Sometimes the secrets of the gods were partly revealed in epic tales, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh. That disclosed the debate among the gods that led to the decision to let man mankind perish in the deluge, or in a text titled Atra Hasis, which recalled the mutiny of the Anunnaki who had toiled in the gold mines that led to the creation of primitive worker earthlings. From time to time, the leaders of the astronauts themselves authored compositions, sometimes dictating the text to a chosen scribe, as the text called the Era Epos, in which one of the two gods who had caused the nuclear calamity sought to shift the blame to his adversary. Sometime the god acted as his own scribe, as is the case regarding the book of the secrets of Toth, the Egyptian god of knowledge, which the god had secreted in a subterranean chamber. When the Lord God Yahweh, according to the Bible, granted the commandments to his chosen people, he first inscribed in his own hand two stone tablets that he gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. When Moses threw down and broke that first set of tablets in response to the golden calf incident, the replacement set was written by Moses on the tablets on both their sides when he stayed on the mount 40 days and 40 nights, recording the dictated words of the Lord. Were it not for a tale recorded on papyrus from the time of the Egyptian king Khufu concerning the book of the secrets of Toth, the existence of that book would have not become known. Were it not for the biblical narratives in Exodus and Deuteronomy, we would have never known about the divine tablets and their contents. All would have become part of the enigmatic body of lost books whose very existence would ne have never come to light. No less painful is the fact that in some instances we do know that certain texts had existed but are in the dark regarding their contents. Such is the case regarding the book of the Wars of Yahweh and the book of Dasher, or also known as the book of righteousness, which are specifically mentioned in the Bible. In at least two instances, the existence of olden books, earlier texts known to the biblical narrator, can be inferred, chapter 5 of Genesis, with the statement, this is the book of the, Todel of the Toldoth of Adam. The term told off being usually translated as generations, but more accurately meaning historic or genealogical record. Yeah, the, the book, of, yeah, the, the edemic, the uh, record of Adam or the uh, genealogy of Isis. That's what it, uh, it really means. That's what the book of Genesis means. So that's interesting that chapter five of Genesis begins with the statement, this is the book of told off of Adam of the told off of Adam, meaning the genealogical record of Adam. Well, um, Adam supposedly is, the, uh, is, is what we know in Egyptian mythology as you have Isis, Osiris, and Horus. And uh, that's the Trinity. That's where the, what we know is the Holy Trinity comes from. It's, it's, it's just amazing stuff. Wow. <clears throat> so that's exactly what Gen the book of Genesis means, yeah. So this is the book of Toldoth of Adam, the, the, the term Toldoth being usually translated as generations or meaning historic or genealogical record. The other instance is in chapter 6 of Genesis where the events concerning Noah and the deluge begin with the words, these are the Toldoth of Noah. Indeed, partial versions of a book that became known as the book of Adam and Eve have survived over the millennia in Armenian, Slovak, Syriac, and Ethiopic languages, and the Book of Enoch, one of the so-called apocryphal books that were not included in the canonized Bible. They contain segments that are considered by scholars to be fragments of a much earlier Book of Noah. An oft-quoted example of the extent of lost books is that of the famed Library of Alexandria in Egypt. Established by the general Ptolemy after Alexander's death, in 323 B.C., it was said to have contained more than half a million volumes of books inscribed on a variety of materials, clay, stone, papyrus, parchment, etc. That great library, where scholars gathered to study the accumulated knowledge, was burnt down and destroyed in the wars that extended from 48 B.C. to the Arab conquest in A.D. 642. 
What has remained of its treasures is a translation of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible into Greek and fragments retained in the writings of some of the library's resident scholars. It is only thus that we know that the Second King Ptolemy Commission, circa 270 B.C., an Egyptian priest whom the Greeks called Man, uh, uh, Mantho to compile the history and prehistory of Egypt. At first, Mantho wrote, only the gods reigned there, then demigods, and finally, circa 3100 B.C., pharaonic dynasties began. The divine reigns, he wrote, began 10,000 years before the flood and continued for thousands of years thereafter, the latter period having witnessed battles and wars among the gods. In the Asiatic domains of Alexander, where rain fell into the hands of the general, Selakos and his successors, a similar effort to provide the Greek servants with a record of past events took place. A priest of the Babylon, uh, Babylonian god Marduk, Barosus, with access to libraries of clay tablets whose core was the temple library of Haran, now in southeastern Turkey, wrote down in three volumes a history of gods and men that began 432,000 years before the deluge, when the gods came to earth from the heavens, listing by name and reign durations the first ten commanders, Barosus reported that the first leader, dressed as a fish, waded ashore from the sea. He was the one who gave mankind civilization, and his name, rendered in Greek, was Cams. Dovetailing in many details, both priests thus rendered accounts of gods of heaven who had come to earth of a time when gods alone reigned on earth and of the catastrophic deluge. In the fragmentary bits and pieces retained in other contemporary writings from the three volumes, Barossa specifically reported the existence of writings from before the great flood stone tablets that were hidden for safekeeping in an ancient city called Sippar, one of the original cities established by the ancient gods. Though Sippar, as were other pre diluvial cities of the gods, was overwhelmed and obliterated by the deluge, a reference to the pre diluvial writing surfaced in the annals of the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal when archaeologists in the 19th century found the ancient Assyrian capital, Nineveh, until then known only from the Old Testament, they discovered in the ruins of a palace with the remains of some 25,000 inscribed clay tablets an assiduous collector of olden texts, Ashurbanipal boasted in his annals, the God of scribes has bestowed upon me the gift of the knowledge of his art. I have been initiated into the secrets of writing. I can even read the intricate tablets in Shemirian. I understand the enigmatic words in the stone carvings from the days before the flood. It is now known that the Sumerian or Sumerian civilization had blossomed in what is now Iraq almost a millennium before the beginning of the Pharaonic Age in Egypt, both to be followed later by the civilization of the Indus Valley in the Indian subcontinent. It is now also known that the Sumerians were the first to write down the annals of tales of gods and men from which all other peoples, including the Hebrews, obtained the tales of creation of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the deluge, the Tower of Babel, and of the wars and loves of the gods, as reflected in the writings and recollections of the Greeks, Hittites, Canaanites, Persians, and Indo-Europeans. As all these olden writings attest, their sources were even earlier texts, some found, but many lost. The volume of such early writings is staggering. Not thousands, but tens of thousands of clay tablets have been discovered in the ruins of the ancient Near East. Many deal with or record aspects of daily life, such as trade or workers' wages and nuptial contracts. Others found mostly in palace libraries constitute royal annals. Still others discovered in the ruins of temple libraries or of scribal schools constitute a group of canonized texts. A secret literature that were written down in the Sumerian language and then translated to Akkadian the first Semitic language, and then other ancient languages. And even in those early writings going back almost 6,000 years, references are made to lost books, texts inscribed on stone tablets. Among the incredible to say fortunate um, does not fully convey the miracle finds in the ruins of ancient cities and their libraries. 
there are clay prisms inscribed with the very information about the 10 pre-Diluvian rulers and their 432,000 years total reign to which Barossus had referred. Known as the Sumerian king lists. Let me get a drink here. Known as the Sumerian king lists and on display in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, there are several versions leave no doubt that the Sumerian compilers had access to some earlier common or canonized textual material. Coupled with other equally early texts discovered in various states of preservation, they strongly suggest that the original recorder of the arrival, as well as of the preceding events and certainly of the following events, had to be one of those leaders, a key participant and an eyewitness. One who had been an eyewitness to all those events, indeed a key participant in them, was, a, a, was the leader who had splashed down with the first group of astronauts. At that time, his epitaph name was Ea, E-A, he whose home is water. He experienced the disappointment of having command of Earth mission given to his half-brother and rival in Lil, Lord of the Command. A humiliation little mitigated by granting him the title in Key, Lord of Earth, relegated away from the cities of the gods and their spaceport in the Eden, Eden, E-D-I-N, which, of course, Eden, to supervise the mining of gold in the Abzu, which was in southern, southeastern Africa. It was Ya Inki, a great scientist, who came across the hominids who inhabited those parts. And so when the Anunnaki toiling in the gold mines mutinied and said, no more, it was he who realized that the needed manpower could be obtained by jumping the gun on evolution through genetic engineering, and thus did the Adam, literally, he of the earth, earthling, came into being. As a hybrid, the Adam could not procreate. The events echoed in the biblical tale of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden record the second genetic manipulation by Enki that added the extra chromosomal genes needed for sexual procreation. And when mankind proliferating did not turn out the way it had been envisaged, it was he, Enki, who defied his brother Enlil's plans to let mankind perish in the deluge. The events whose hero has been called Noah in the Bible and to Sudra in the earlier original Sumerian text. The firstborn son of Anu, Nibiru's ruler Ea Enki, was well versed in his planets and its inhabitants' past. Uh, and this is a, see, this is where I start to already have problems with this. This, this, um, I don't, I'm not convinced that that they were. I'm just, dumb, I don't believe 100 percent what they tell us. You know, Anunnaki came from Nibiru and all that. I just, I don't believe that. I still think that's a red herring. But, it, but that's what you always see Sitchin referring to. And I still, I still just don't. The, 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 the archaeological stuff doesn't doesn't point in that direction. It points more in the direction of uh, Sirius or Cygnus or Polaris. I mean, it just uh, it just doesn't point in the direction of uh, of the, some planet that we have. Uh, you know, we we may or may not have ever even really identified. We have hard evidence that points archaeological things like the pyramids and uh, Gobekli Tepe, and I mean, you've got. <laughs> All these ancient megalithic signs all around the world lined up to, 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 to stars, to certain systems. And then you see things like the Freemasons being obsessed with Sirius and, and the whole star systems there, and then the Dogon. And I mean, I just have a hard time believing that um, these, the, the, the Anunnaki came, they just don't seem to have come from within our own solar system. I have a hard time believing that. An accomplished scientist, he bequeathed his most important aspects of advanced knowledge of the Anunnaki, especially to his two sons, Marduk and uh, Ningish Zeta, who as Egyptian gods were known there as Ra and Toth, respectively. But he also was instrumental in sharing with mankind certain aspects of such advanced knowledge by teaching to selected individuals the secrets of the gods. In at least two instances, such initiates wrote down, as they were instructed to do, those divine teachings as mankind's heritage. Right, and that's what I was referencing earlier in the show, our, our birthright. That's what they were instructing him to write down. One called Adapa, and probably a son of Enki by a human female, is known to have written a book titled Writings Regarding Time, one of the earliest lost books. The other called the Edmund Durong, uh, the, let me get this right, the 
Inmed Oranki, the Inmed Oranki, E N M E D U R A N K I, the Inmed Oranki, another one of the books that was supposed to be our birthright, was in all probability the prototype of the biblical Enoch the one who was taken up into heaven after he had entrusted his sons the book of divine secrets, and of which a version has possibly survived in the extra-biblical book of Enoch. Though the firstborn of Anu, he was not destined to be his father's successor on the throne of Nibiru. Complex rules of secession, which reflected the convoluted history of their planet, gave the privilege to Inki's half-brother Enlil. And in Lil is also what we, that's where the whole thing of, you know, uh, Jesus and the devil comes from, that whole, you know, that whole dynamic. That's, that's in, in Lil and Enki. That's what the two twin towers represented, in Lil and Enki. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good signal of bringing those things down, bringing down in Lil and Enki that, you know, these custodial rulers definitely, you know, you want to get down to who really pulled off 9-11, there you go. In the effort to resolve the bitter conflict, both Enki and Enlil ended up on a mission to an alien planet Earth whose goal was needed to create a shield for preserving Nibiru's dwindling atmosphere. It was against that background, made even more complex by the presence on Earth of their half-sister Ninarshag, the chief medical officer of the Anunnaki, that Enki decided to defy Enlil's plans to have mankind perish in the deluge. The conflict carried on between the two half-brothers' sons, even among their grandchildren. The fact that all of them, and especially those born on Earth, faced the loss of longevity that Nibiru's extended orbital period provided, added personal agonies and sharpened ambitions. It all came to a climax in the last century of the third millennium B.C., when Marduk, Enki's firstborn by his official spouse, claimed that he and not Enlil's firstborn son, Ninurta, should inherit the earth. The bitter conflict that included a series of wars led in the end to the use of nuclear weapons. And that's what I was mentioning earlier when the uh, listener had uh, asked me about, you know, the sun symbols. And that's why I said I think it has something to do with nuclear weapons and extraterrestrials because, uh, you know, Polaris, the... Uh, long-range nuclear missiles launched by uh, submarines um, and uh, also the, uh, uh, you know, just the, the, the whole thing with how they use nuclear weapons on Earth and uh, that being the North Star and all those, you know, sun symbols. Again, you know, when you, when those, when you see those depictions of the sun in Egyptian things or anything else, you know, it's not, that doesn't always mean our sun or our star. It could mean someone else is a star somewhere else. That's what people never think. They never teach you that in school. People need to know that information. It's very key. It changes everything once you know that. The bitter conflict that included a series of wars led to the end of the use, in the end to the use of nuclear weapons. The ensuing, though unintended result was the demise of the Sumerian civilization. And that's true because that's one of the things that's even, that's, you know, that they will admit to actually in, in a high school textbook. The Sumerians disappear. Gone, poof, in the wind, in the dust. Some people think they got raptured out by aliens, but uh, I think probably the more, uh, <laughs> I think what I believe <coughs> is that they were vaporized by the use of these extraterrestrial uh, nuclear weapons. And again, the reason I believe that is because, as we talked about earlier, the pre-flood ash. The initiation of chosen individuals into the secrets of the gods had marked the beginning of priesthood, the, legion, the lineages of mediators between the gods and the people, the transmitters of the divine words to the mortal earthlings. Oracles' interpretations of divine utterances were commingled with the observation of the heavens for omens. And as mankind was increasingly drawn to take sides in the godly conflicts, prophecy began to play a role. Indeed, the, te the term to denote such spokesmen of the gods who proclaimed what was to come, Nabi, was the epitaph for Marduk's firstborn son, Nabu, who had tried on behalf of his exiled father to convince mankind that the heavenly signs bespoke the coming supremacy of Marduk. 
These developments sharpen the realization that one must distinguish between fate and destiny. The proclamations of Enlil, sometimes even of Anu, that used to be unquestioned, were now subjected to the scrutiny of the difference between Nam and destiny, like the planetary orbits, whose course had been determined and was unchangeable, and Namtar, literally, a destiny that could be bent, broken, changed which was fate. Reviewing and recalling the sequence of events and the apparent parallel, uh, parallelism between what had happened on Nibiru and what took place on Earth, Enki and Enlil begin to ponder philosophically what indeed was destined and could not have been avoided, and what was just fated as a consequence of right or wrong decisions and free choice. The latter could not be predicted. The former could be foreseen, especially if all, as the planetary orbits, was cyclical. If what was shall be again, if the first things shall also be the last things. The climactic event of the nuclear desolation sharpened soul-searching among the leaders of the Anunnaki and raised the need to explain to the devastated human masses why it came to pass this way. Was it destined, or was it just the result of an Anunnaki-made fate? Was anyone responsible? Is there someone accountable? In the councils of the Anunnaki on the eve of the calamity, it was Enki who stood alone in opposition to the use of the forbidden weapon. It was thus important for Enki to explain to the suffering remnants that the turning point in the saga of extraterrestrials who had meant well but ended as destroyers had come to pass, and who but Ea Enki, who was the first to come and, and be an eyewitness to it all, was the most qualified to tell the people so that the future could be divined, and what was the best way to tell that it was all a first-person report by Enki himself. This is kind of in broken English. I apologize. I'm not... I know how to read, but it's... And the best way to tell it was all as a, as a first-person report by Enki himself. It's just... I don't think Zachariah Sitchin spoke good English. It's just, it's just, I'm, I'm reading it exactly as it is on the page. And some of this stuff I'm having to like improvise because it's just bad English. I hate that. It's like every time I find a book I want to read, it's written by a fucking first grader. It sucks. Uh, that he had recorded his autobiography as certain for a long text stretching over at least 12 tablets was discovered in a library. And it appeared, quotes uh, Erki as saying, when I approached the earth, there was much flooding. When I neared its green meadows, heaps and mounds were piled up at my command. In a pure place, I built my house in appropriate name I gave it. The long text continues to describe how Ea or Enki then assigned tasks to his lieutenants, putting their mission to earth in motion. Numerous other texts that relate varied aspects of Enki's role and the ensuing development serve to, comp uh, to complete Enki's tale. They include a, a commogeny, an epic of creation, at whose core lay Enki's own text, which scholars call the Eridu Genesis. They include detailed descriptions of the fashioning of the atom. They describe how other Anunnaki, male and female, came to Enki in his city Eridu to obtain from him the me a kind of data disk that encoded all aspects of civilization, and they include texts of Enki's private life and personal problems, such as the tale of his attempts to attain a son by his half-sister Ninarshak, his promiscuous affair with both goddesses and the daughters of man, and the unforeseen consequences thereof. The Atra Hasis text throws light on Anu's efforts to prevent a flare-up of the Enki and Lil rivalries by dividing Earth's domains between them. And texts recording the events preceding the deluge render almost verbatim the debates in the Council of the Gods about the fate of mankind and Enki's subterfuge known as the Tale of Noah and the Ark Tale known from the Bible until one of its original Mesopotamia versions was found in the tablets in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Sumerian and Akkadian clay tablets, Babylonian and Assyrian temple libraries, Egyptian, Hittite, and Canaanite myths and the biblical narratives are the main body of written-down memories of the affairs of gods and men. For the first time ever, this dispersed and fragmented material has been assembled and used by Zachariah Sitchin to recreate the eyewitness accounts of Enki, 
the autobiographical memoirs and insightful prophecies of an extraterrestrial god. Presented as a text dictated by Enki to a chosen scribe, a book of witnessing to the unsealed to be unsealed at an appropriate time. It brings to mind Yahweh's instructions to the prophet Isaiah. Now come, write it on a sealed tablet as a book and engrave it. Let it be the witnessing until the last day, a testimony for all time. In dealing with the past, Enki himself perceived the future. The notion that the Anunnaki exercising free will were masters of their own fates, as well as the fate of mankind, gave way in the end to a realization that it was destiny, that when all was said and done, determined the course of events, and therefore, as the Hebrew prophets had recognized, the first, thing, first things shall be the last things. The record of events dictated by Enki thus becomes a foundation for prophecy, and the past becomes the future. In the seventh year after the great calamity in the second month, on the 17th day, I was summoned by my master, the Lord Enki, great God, benevolent fashioner of mankind, omnipotent and merciful. I was among the remnants of Eridu who had escaped to the arid steppe just as the evil wind was nearing the city, the evil wind nearing the city, a nuclear blast. And I wandered off into the wilderness to seek withered twigs for firewood. And I looked up and to behold, a whirlwind came out of the south. Maybe it was a UFO landing. There was a reddish brilliance about it, and it made no sound. Well, a lot of UFOs have been described as making no sound, haven't they? And as it reached the ground, four straight feet spread out from its belly, and brilliance appeared. I mean, come on. Four? I, you got, give me a fucking break. You know? Four little feet come right out of Atlanta. Just classic flying saucer here. You know? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Are you make, Now, you, you, you read that, and you it just makes total sense to you why the first thing they did during the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was uh, to invade the Baghdad Museum and take all of these cylinder seals and clay tablets that have all this information in it. You know, when people started figuring out that, it, you know, it openly talks about UFOs landing on the ground, that, that started to become a, power, a, a problem for the power structure, considering Saddam Hussein was about to create this gigantic new library and put all of this stuff out there for, for people to see. And they, well, what, what they were going to see, he was going to also reveal was that the, the inhabitants of uh, Iraq that uh, originated there from ancient Mesopotamia were truly God's chosen people. And, and that was actually the land talked about in biblical times and that, you know, the Jews and, and, and the, what, what we know as Semites, not non-Arabs, were the imposters. So, you know, that combined with, you know, some, a library where you could go see for yourself and translate for yourself stuff like this where it's clearly talking about UFOs landing on the ground. I mean, my goodness, you, now you know what this whole thing has been about. Now you know why they're obsessed with antiquities. Four straight feet spread out from its belly and the brilliance appeared. A bri brilliance means a bright light. So four legs came out out of a whirlwind with no sound and a bright light came out of the center of it. And I threw myself to the ground and prostrated myself where I knew that it was a divine vision. Of course, you know, UFOs land. These people don't have any idea what this technology is. They, their only reference point is that it's God's. And when I lifted my eyes, there were two divine emissaries standing near me. And they had the faces of men, and their garments were sparkling like burnished brass. And they called me by name and spoke to me, saying, You are summoned by the great God, the Lord Enki. Fear not, you are blessed. And we are here to take you aloft and carry you unto his retreat in the land of Megan, on the island amidst the river of Megan, where the Sluices are. Sluices. S-L-U-I-S-E-S. -E Don't know what that is, but S-L-U-I-S. Uh, I'm sorry. S-L-U-I-C-E-S. Sluices. And they spoke. The whirlwind lifted itself as a fiery, fiery chariot and was gone. And they took me by my hands, each one grasping me by one hand. And they lifted me and car carried me swiftly between the earth and the heavens. Yeah, our first documented abduction here. 
<laughs> and carried me between the earth and heavens as the eagle soars and I could see the land and the waters. I mean, my goodness, classic UFO uh, abduction. The plains and the mountains, and they let me down on the island at the gateway of the great God's abode. And the moment that they let go of my hands, a brilliance as I had never seen before engulfed and overwhelmed me. And I collapsed on the ground as though voided of the spirit of life. My life senses returned to me as if awakened from the deepest sleep by the sound of the calling of my name. I was in some kind of an enclosure. It was dark, but there was also an aura. Then my name was called again by the deepest of voices. And although I could hear it, I could not tell whence the voice came, nor can I see whoever it was that spoke. And I said, here I am. Then the voice said to me, in Dubsar, offspring of Adapa, I have chosen you to be my scribe, that you write down my words on the tablets. And all at once there appeared a glowing in one part of the enclosure. And I saw a place arranged like a scribal workplace, a scribe's table and a scribe's stool. And there were finely shaped stones upon the table, but I saw no clay tablets nor containers of wet clay. And there lay upon the, ta the table only one stylus. And it glistened in the glowing as no reed stylus ever did. It was a computer. <laughs> you, you, you scribed it on a computer, yeah. And the voice spoke up again saying, In Dubsar, son of Iridu City, my faithful servant, I am your Lord Enki. I have summoned you to write down my words, for I am much distraught by what has befallen mankind by the great calamity. It is my wish to record the true course of the events. To let gods and men alike know that my hands are clean. Not since the great deluge had such a calamity befallen the earth and the gods and the earthlings. But the great deluge was destined to happen. Not so the great calamity. This one, seven years ago, need not have happened. It could have been prevented, and I, Enki, did all I could to prevent it. Alas, I failed. And was it fate, or was it destiny? In the future shall it be judged, for at the end of days a day of judgment there shall be. On that day the earth shall quake, and the river shall change course. And there shall be darkness at noon, and a fire in the heavens in the night. The day of the returning celestial God will it be. And who shall survive, and who would perish? Who shall be rewarded and who will be punished? Gods and men alike on that day shall it be discovered. For what shall come to pass by what had passed shall be determined. And what was destined shall in a cycle be repeated. And what was fated and only by the heart's will occurring for good or I shall for judgment come. The voice fell silent. Then the great Lord spoke up again saying, it is for this reason that I will tell the true account of the beginnings and of the prior times and of the olden times. For in the past, the future lies hidden. For 40 days and 40 nights shall I speak and you will write. 40 shall be the count of the days and the nights of your task here. For 40 is my sacred number among the gods. For 40 days and 40 nights you shall neither eat nor drink. Only this once of bread and water you shall partake, and it shall sustain you for the duration of your task. And the voice paused, and all at once there appeared a glowing in another part of the enclosure. And I saw a table, and upon it a plate and a cup. And I rose up there too, and there was bread on the plate and water in the cup. And the voice of the great Lord Enki spoke up again, saying, In Dubsar, eat the bread and drink the water and be sustained for 40 days and 40 nights, and I, and I did as directed. And therefore the voice directed me to sit myself at the scribal table, and the glowing there intensified. I could see neither door nor aperture where I was, yet the glowing was as strong as the midday sun. And the voice said, In Dubsar, the scribe, what do you see? And I looked, and I saw the glowing rate upon the table, and the stones, and the stylus, and I said, I see stone tablets and their hue is blue as pure as the sky. And I see a stylus, as I have never seen before, its stem unlike any reed and its tip like an eagle's talon. And the voice said, These are the tablets upon which you shall inscribe my words. 
By my wish, they have been cut of the finest lapis lazuli, each with two smooth faces provided. And the stylus you see is a god's handiwork, its handle made of electrum, and its tip of divine crystal. It shall firmly fit in your hand, and what you shall engrave with it shall be as easy as marking upon wet clay. In two columns you shall inscribe the front face. In two columns you shall inscribe the back of each stone tablet. Do not deviate from my words and utterances. And there was a pausing, and I touched one of the stones, and the surface thereof felt like a smooth skin, soft to the touch. And I picked up the holy stylus, and it felt like a feather in my hand. And then the great god Enki began to speak. And I began to write down his words exactly as he had spoken them. At times his voice was strong, at times almost a whisper. At times there was a joy or pride in his voice, at times pain or agony. And as one tablet was inscribed on all its faces, I took another to continue. And when the final words were spoken, the great God paused, and I could hear a great sigh. And he said, In Dubsar, my servant, for forty days and forty nights you have faithfully recorded my words. Your task here is completed. Now take hold of another tablet, and on it you shall write your own attestation. And at the end thereof, as a witness, mark it with your seal, and take the tablet and put it together with those other tablets in the divine chest, for at a designated time, chosen ones shall come hither, and they shall find the chest and the tablets, and they shall learn all that I have dictated to you, and that true account of the beginnings and the prior times, and the olden times, and the great calamity shall henceforth be known as the words of the Lord Inki. And it shall be a book of witnessing of the past, and a book of foretelling the future. For the future in the past lies, and the first thing shall also be the last things. Which means, if in the beginning there were gods on earth, that means in the end, there's going to be gods on earth. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. And there was a pause, and I took the tablets, and I put them one by one in their correct order in the chest. And the chest was made of acacia wood, and it was inlaid with gold on the outside. Sounds like the Ark of the Covenant, doesn't it? And the voice of my Lord said, Now close the chest, cover, and fasten its lock. And I did as directed. And there was another pause, and my lord Inki said, And as for you, in Dubsar, with a great God you have spoken. And though you have not seen me in my presence, you have been. Therefore you are blessed, and my spokesman to the people you shall be. You shall admonish them to be righteous, for in that lies a good and long life. And you shall comfort them, for in seventy years the cities will be rebuilt and the crops shall sprout again. There will be peace, but there will also be wars. New nations will become mighty. Kingdoms shall rise and fall. The olden gods shall step aside, and new gods shall decree the fates. But at the end of days, destiny shall prevail. And of that future, it is foretold in my words about the past. All of that in Dubsar to the people you shall tell. And there was a pause and a silence, and I, Undubsar, bowed to the ground and said, But how will I know what to say? And the voice of the Lord Inki said, The signs will be in the heavens, and the words to utter shall come to you in dreams and in visions. And after you are there, and after you, there will be another chosen prophet and other chosen prophets. And in the end, there will be a new earth and a new heaven. And for prophets, there will be no more need. And then there was silence, and the auras were extinguished, and the spirit left me. And when I regained my senses, I was in the fields outside Eridu. Um, so there you go. There's the end of that. Now we're, we're moving on here. The words of Lord Inki, synopsis of the first tablet, lamentation over the desolation of Sumir. We're going to continue in our reading from... Uh, uh, 
the Lost Book of Enki. Interesting stuff here. Um, and especially <laughs> interesting to sort of, uh, that's why I wanted to follow up uh, the Gods of Eden that we read with William Bramley with, uh, with this one. You know, follow up. Now that we got, now that we got the premise, now that we figure, you know, we've gotten that added into the vocabulary. That, I think that was the the best thing I think I've uh, uh, that I took away from reading that. And uh, hopefully, you took that away too. Was that it? Sort of added, you know, the other pieces of uh, uh, of the picture to this worldview of you know the new world order and and the Illuminati and the whole thing. It did for me anyway, and I think that now that we, since we've done that, now reading, you know, actually stuff that's, you know, from the Sumerian tablets and whatnot is uh, is highly interesting. So we're going to jump back into that. TheGlobalReality.com, that's www.TheGlobalReality.com. That, uh, that is my website where this broadcast originates from. And... Uh, It says, uh, I got an email here, another email from Lori. Lori says, hey, Josh, I'm glad you're reading this book. I really enjoy your commentary while reading these books. A lot of things pop in your head that aren't popping in mine. <laughs> while you're reading Gods of Eden, I started reading Lost Book of Enki. You started reading that at, as I was reading Gods of Eden. That's odd. Uh, it's a hard read and kind of reads like the Bible, this father, son, brothers, cousins, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, I'd look up some of the, name, the changes of some of these guys in the book. Like, uh, Murdoch is also raw. Don't know if, uh, they are right or not. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's true. R Murdoch raw, uh, you know, um, a lot, yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of the ones, the ones that started out as Sumerian ones later became the, the verbatim, the same ones that were in Egyptian, uh, mythology and stuff. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. The same, the same God, they just had different names. Uh, but, uh, Anyway, there you go. So thanks, thanks so much, Delory, for that. Uh, again, chipping banner donate button is there at the website, and uh, we uh, need to be getting in more support than we have over this past week. We need to, an influx of cash right now because we're, we're we're just trying to get every you know get back on on the track and get back on getting uh, be able to get the film out very soon. I'm shooting for middle of July for Sea Grind Volume Two, and uh, just trying to you know after losing a couple of weeks with all the stuff that was going on, I'm trying to get back on on doing that. So. Any support we can get, chipping banner, donate button, anything we can get in right now uh, would be great. And we don't get a lot of stuff over the weekends when we don't have shows, and uh, you know we could really use it right now. So, because what what I mean with paying the stream bill and stuff right right, right now, we're not going to have anything to we're going to be at zero after that. So, we could use some help right now. I want to put that out there and let everybody know that it is serious. I'm not just saying you know donate like it's every day or something. We do need to get some stuff in. Uh, you know, if you're hearing this on a rebroadcast or something, then please donate if you can. All right. Synopsis of the first tablet, Lamentation over the Desolation of Samir. How the gods fled their cities as the nuclear cloud spread. The debates in the council of the gods, the fateful decision to unleash the weapons of terror. The origin of the gods and the awesome weapons on Nibiru. Nibiru's north-south wars, unification and dynastic rules. Nibiru's place in the solar system. A dwindling atmosphere causes climate changes. Efforts to obtain gold to shield the atmosphere fail. Alalu, a usurper, uses nuclear weapons to stir volcanic gases. A new, a dynastic hare disposes Alalu. Alalu steals a spacecraft and escapes from Nibiru. The first tablet. So now we're reading from the first tablet. Here we go. The words of the Lord Inki, firstborn son of Anu, who reigns on Nibiru. With heavy spirit, I utter laments. Laments that are bitter fill my heart. How smitten is the land, its people delivered to the evil wind, its stables abandoned, its sheepfolds empty. Yeah, it was, you know, Samir was <laughs> reduced to dust. That's why the, the Sumerians just disappeared. They got wiped out by a nuclear war. How smitten are the cities? Their people piled up as dead corpses afflicted by the evil wind. How smitten are the fields, their vegetation withered, touched by the evil wind. How smitten are the rivers, nothing swims anymore, pure sparkling waters turned into poison. Of its black-headed people, Sumir is emptied, gone is all life. 
of its cattle and sheep, Samir is emptied. Silent is the hum of churning milk. In its glorious cities, only the wind howls. Death is the only smell. The temples whose heads to heaven arose by their gods have been abandoned. Of lordship and kingship command, there is none. Scepter and tiara are now gone. On the banks of the two great rivers, once lush and life-giving, only weeds grow. No one treads the highways. No one seeks out the roads. Flourishing Sumer is like an abandoned desert. How smitten is the land, home of gods and men. On that land, a calamity fell, one unknown to man. A calamity that mankind had never before seen. One that could not be withstood. On all the lands from west to east, a disruptive hand of terror was placed. The gods in their cities were helpless as man. An evil wind, a storm born in a distant plain, a great calamity wrought in its path. A death-dealing wind born in the west, its way to the east is made, its course set by fate. A storm devouring as the deluge by wind and not by water, a destroyer by poisoned air, not tidal waves overwhelming. By fate, not destiny, was it engendered. The great gods and their council, the great calamity had caused. By Enlil and Nirhashag, it was permitted. I alone, for a halt, was beseeching. Day and night to accept with the heaven's decree, I argued, to no avail. So he's basically saying he tried to stop it. They wouldn't listen to him. Ninurta, Enlil's warrior son, and Nurgle, my very own son, poisoned weapons in the great plain, then unleashed them. That an evil wind shall follow the brilliance we knew not. Thy now cry in agony. They act like they didn't know what these weapons were going to do. They'd never used them before. Much you, you almost see them in, in, as almost in the same place that we are now with our technology. It's almost as if that's where they were at, you know, a little bit more advanced than us. They could travel places, but, you know, when, b- b- before anybody ever dropped a nuclear weapon, nobody knew what it was going to do, even though they had that technology, you know, and, and knew about it, but just didn't, you know, they didn't know. Seems like this was kind of the same way. In their holy cities, the gods stood disbelieving as the evil wind towards Sumer made its way. One after another, the gods fled their cities, their temples abandoned to the wind. In my city, Iridu, as the poison cloud approached, I could do nothing to stop it. Escape to the open steppe, to the people I gave instructions, with Ninki, my spouse, the city I, ba- I abandoned. In his city, Nippur, place of the bond heaven earth, in little could do nothing to stop it. The evil wind against Nippur was onrushing in his celestial boat. UFO. <laughs> Pretty clear, celestial boat. Give me a break. And Lil and his spouse hurriedly took off. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, the, the tough gods, the, you know, these all almighty, all powerful, all loving gods, you know, puke. Drop nuclear weapons on us, then get in their fucking spaceships and haul ass, haul ass out of here. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You know, as above, so below, right? Sounds like what they want to do to us. You know, the past is prologue. Like what? What? When that? What it said at the beginning of this? Something to that effect. What's happened in the past determines the future. You know, so the gods, the extraterrestrials, they drop nuclear weapons on us and they hauled ass in their spaceships and got the fuck out of here, and then you know, left us all down here to die. That very well could be what's going to happen again. A lot of evidence pointing that direction in there. The uh, in Ur Shumer, uh, Sumer city of kingship, Nanar to his father Enlil for help cried. In the place of the temple that to the heaven in seven steps rises, Nanar the hand of fate refused to heed. My father who begot me, great God who to Ur had granted kingship, turned the evil wind away. Nanar pleaded. Great God who decrees the fates, let Ur and its people be spared. Your praises to continue. Nanar appealed. Enlil answered his son, Nanar, noble son. Your wondrous city kingship was granted. Eternal reign, it was not granted. Take hold of your spouse, Ningal. Flee the city. Even I who decree fates, its destiny, I cannot bend. <coughs> Thus did Enlil, my brother, speak. Alas. Alas, not a destiny it was. 
a calamity none greater since the deluge, gods and earthlings has befallen. Alas, not a destiny it was. The great deluge was destined to happen. The great calamity of the death-dealing storm was not. So they're saying that, you know, uh, again, r- really reinforcing that idea that the great deluge, the great flood, was destined to happen, but the death-dealing storm was not. Well, what makes that interesting is, is that historically, we're, we're often, people are often confused. Um, because there were there there was more than one great flood on this planet. There's more than one great deluge. Because and the reason that we know that is true scientifically, is again because of that layer of pre-flood ash. So according to this, we have the great deluge. We have this great calamity of nuclear weapons unleashed, which again, you know. All across the earth, deep underground, there's a layer of of pre-deluge, pre-flood ash. So according to this, we had a great deluge. We have the nuclear uh, desolation of earth, decimation of earth, reducing it to ash. Then we had another flood after that at some point. And that's proven because it's proven that there was a flood after uh, this event that caused the earth to be reduced to ashes. That's very interesting. And, I've, you know, you see that reference that there was more than one flood. You hear that talked about. By the breach of a vow, by a council decision it was caused, by weapons of terror was it created. By a decision, not destiny, were the poisoned weapons unleashed. By deliberation was the lot cast. So they're saying that this was done with, you know, Impunity. This was done on purpose. There was no accident that these weapons were, uh, these nuclear weapons were deployed. Against Marduk, my firstborn, did the two sons' destruction direct. Vengeance was in their hearts. Ascendancy is not Marduk's to grasp. And Lil's firstborn shouted, With weapons I shall oppose him, Ninurta said. Of people he raised an army, Babili as Earth's naval to declare, Nurgle, Marduk's brother, so shouted. In the council of the great gods, words of venom were spread. Day and night I raised my opposing voice. Peace I counsel, deploring haste. For the second time the people have raised his heavenly image. Why does opposing continue, I asked in pleading. Have all the instruments been checked? Did not the era of Marduk in the heavens arrive, I once more inquired? Ningish Zeta, my very son, Other signs of heaven sighted. His heart, I knew, Marduk's injustice to him could not forgive. Nanartu and Lil on on earthborn was unrelenting too. Marduk, my temple in the north city, (coughs) his own abode made, so he said. Ishkur and Lil's youngest son demanded punishment. In my lands to whore after him, the people he made, he said. Utu, son of Nanar, Marduk's son Nabu, his wrath directed. And this goes on, and this is like on and on. This is like an argument. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fuck you up. No, I'm going to fuck you up. I'm going to fuck you up. No, I'm going to fuck you up. On, you know, pissing contest, essentially. Nurgle, lord of the lower domain, ferociously was demanding, let the olden weapons of terror for obliteration be used. The olden weapons of terror for obliteration, meaning that, that those were, you know, something from the, the weapons of the past of this civilization. You know, kind of like what we, we see people in the future will see nuclear weapons on Earth. Let the olden weapons of terror for obliteration be used. At my own son, I gazed in disbelief. For brother against brother, the terror weapons have been forsworn. Sounds familiar. I mean, why do we think we're in a constant state of war? I mean, you know, that was Bramley's sort of whole premise for the gods of Eden. Well, there you go. That's all we know. That's what the people who created us, or who we call gods, you know, who's, who we are the victims of a gigantic science experiment of. We are, you know, no wonder nobody's ever tried to, you know, no wonder other extraterrestrial races haven't tried to get a hold of us, man. No, we're the bastard sons of the universe. We are. We're the redheaded stepchildren 
of the galaxy. And we wonder why we arm against each other, why we have weapons, and we're all people, man. Why do we want to kill each other? Because the people of the bloodlines who are in positions of power around the globe, from presidents to congressmen to senators to royalty to the crown to all across the board, banking houses, religious institutions, all of these bloodline people are trying to become gods themselves. And to become like their gods, their creators, our creators, to become like them because they feel that they, because they are of the pure bloodline, that gives them the right to do it. It gives them the right to do everything that their creators did. And, and if that means endless war and everybody killing each other, then so be it, because that's what they did. For brother against brother, the terror weapons have been forsworn. Instead of consent, there was silence. In the silence, Elil opened his mouth. Punishment there must be. Like birds without wings, the evildoers shall be. Marduk and Naboo uh, of our heritage are depriving us of our heritage. Let them deprive the place of the celestial chariots. I'm sort of reading this slow and kind of, it's, it's just, all the words are kind of reversed in, to what we would say it, so I'm trying to reverse them a little bit and say them, but, you know, so they're easier to understand for you. Let this place be scorched to oblivion, Ninurta shouted. Let the one who scorches be me. I mean, you know, let me do it. Let me fucking set this place on fire. Let's scorch this motherfucker to oblivion. Let's drop, but let me be, let me pull the trigger. That's what Ninurta is saying. Excited, Nurgle stood up and shouted, let the evildoer cities also be upheavaled. The sinning cities, let me obliterate. Let the annihilator, my name, be thereafter. The earthlings by us created uh, the earthlings that were created by us must not be harmed. The righteous with the sinners must not be perished, I forcefully said. Ninarshog, my creating helpmate, was consenting. The matter is between the gods alone to settle. The people must not be harmed. I knew from the celestial abode to the discussions was giving much heed. I knew who determines fates from his celestial abode, his voice made heard. Let the weapons of terror be used this once. Let the place of the rocket ships be obliterated. Let the people be spared. Let Ninurta the Scorcher be. Let Nergo be the, the annihilator. So did Enlil uh, announce the decision. To them a secret of the gods I shall reveal. The hiding place of the terror weapons to them I shall disclose. The two sons, one mine, one his, to his inner chamber in Lil summoned. Nurgle, as he went by me, averted his gaze to me. Alas, I cried out without words, brother has turned against brother. Are the prior times fated to repeat? A secret from the olden times to them in Lil was revealing. They had entrusted in their hands the weapons of terror. Clad with terror with a brilliance they are unleashed, and they touch to dust and, uh, and turn and heap dust, turn it, everything into dust, essentially, is what they're saying. For brother against brother on earth, they were forsworn and uh, neither region to effect. Now the oath was undone like a broken jar in, a, in useless pieces. The two sons, full of glee, with quickened step from Enlil's chambers, emerged for the wep from, and, and, and the weapons departing. I mean, they launched the weapons. The other gods turned their back to the cities. None of his own calamity had a foreboding. Which means, you know, yeah, they got the fuck out of there. <laughs> now, it, now, this is the account of the prior times and of the weapons of terror. Before the prior times was the beginning. After the prior times was the olden times. In the olden times, the gods came to earth and created the earthlings. In the prior time, none of the gods were on earth, and uh, the earthlings were not yet fashioned. They were not yet made. In the prior times, the abode of the gods was on their own planet. Nibiru is its name. A great planet, reddish in radiance, around the sun in an elongated circuit Nibiru makes. It has a long orbit, allegedly. For a time in the cold is Nibiru engulfed. For 
part of its circuit by the sun strongly is it heated. So every time it starts to get, it does a rotation, it gets so close to the earth that it heats up. But because it's got such a slow orbit, life was able to flourish there, essentially is what they're saying. A thick atmosphere envelops Nibiru by volcanic eruptions. All manner of life this atmosphere sustains, but without the atmosphere, there will only be dying, perishing. In the cold period, the inner heat of Nibiru uh, keeps the planet warm, like a warm coat. In the hot period, it shields Nibiru from the uh, sun-scorching rays. In the midst, uh, in the midst, I guess in the in the springtime, it rains and it holds and releases to lakes and streams, giving rise. Lush, lush vegetation, our atmosphere uh, feeds and protects. All manner of life in the waters and on land has uh, has been caused to sprout. After eons of time, our own species sprouted, and by our own essence, an eternal seed was used to procreate. Which basically says, yeah. In, uh, in, in, an eternal seed was used. I mean, something came along and created them. You know, they may be the gods that created mankind, but somebody created them too. Who was it? See, I mean, we're not even ready to ask that question as as a people on this planet, are we? You know, that that, that if there is a god or gods, most likely that god or gods has a god too. Someone who created them. Well, who is that? You know, this is the, 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 this is going to start to to open up more more questions than it is answers. As our numbers grew, to many regions of Nibiru, our ancestors spread. Some tilled the land. Some four legged creatures she, uh, shepherded uh, shepherded like well, they had dogs. Is what it means. I knew dogs were from another planet. Fucking cats too, bastards. I love dogs and cats though. <laughs> They're great. Fucking love them. And sometimes, man, you get you get a good one. You're like, man, you are not from this planet. My cat, I don't know where the fuck planet my cat's from. He ain't from here, though. I, I swear he's a spy from Sirius. Tries to get on computers, gets on people's computers and type shit. It's out of control. Some lived on the mountains, some in the valleys uh, made their home. They made, Some of them made their homes in the valleys, it's saying. Rivalries occurred, encroachments happened, clashes occurred, sticks became weapons. Clans gathered into tribes, and then two great nations faced each other. The nation of the north took arms against the nation of the south. And uh, it talks about that they threw spears, which they call missiles, and they weapons of thunder and brilliance. You increase the terror. So they, they started out with, you know, sticks and then it became weapons guns and then missiles and then weapons of thunder so, you know it kind of sounds like the evolution of our weapons doesn't it you know first it was sticks then it was you know bows and arrows and, and you know spears and all that and swords then it became you know bullets and missiles and weapons of thunder which you know that's our modern day weaponry isn't it weather warfare harp and chemtrails so i mean that that almost <laughs> Wow, that almost sounds like there was, you know, an evolution of, of weapons in the same way we've seen an evolution of weapons. A war long and fierce engulfed the planet, brother amassed against brother. There was death and destruction both north and south. For many circuits, desolation reigned the land and all life was diminished. So for many uh, orbits, for many rotations around the sun, there was no life on Nibiru at all. Then a truce was declared and peacemaking was conducted. Let the nations be united, the emissaries said to one another. Yeah, they are forming another world order. So they, this is great, isn't it? They have a war, brother against brother on the whole planet. Everybody wipes everybody out it, 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 except for a few, and then the few that are left form um, a new world order where everybody's united. Sound familiar? I mean, that's what as above, so below means, folks. That's why they take that so seriously. As in the macrocosm, so in the microcosm. I mean, it looks like this is lining up to, 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 to be our fate as well. Well, you know what? Just as it said here, is it fate or is it destiny? It was destiny for, for that, uh, 
for that flood to happen, but it was it was just it was the fate of them to be wiped out nuclear by nuclear weapons. Well, this doesn't have to be our fate. Our fate can be determined by our actions or our inactions. But if we continue to not, you know, do anything, if we, you know, I mean, my goodness, like, like I've talked about, we got listeners in like 30-something countries now. We get to, Our listenership has just been going through the roof, but yet we have three or four or five out of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of listeners that, that donate and support our work. Are we going to choose to do like we've always done and be lazy and, and, and assume this is somebody else's problem to handle? Or are we going to step up and change fate? Because if, if, if not, then this is what is going to be our fate. If we don't get involved and do something, this is going to be our fate. We are going to some, suffer the same fate that the, the people of old did. And something tells me the elite want it that way. That's exactly what they're planning. I want to play with the big boys. I want to play at the big boy level. We need cash to do that. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable just the epiphanies of reading stuff on air. It just blows me away. Let there be one throne on Nibiru, one king to reign over all. There it is, the new games in town. Divide and conquer. Kill everybody, blow everybody, create all-out warfare, and then come in and pick up the pieces and create a new order. That's what their agenda is is let a leader from north or from south by lot be chosen one king supreme to be if he be from north let south choose a female to be his spouse an equal queen to reign alongside him if he's from the south if they choose one from the south let someone from the north a female from the north be his spouse Husband and wife, let them be as one flesh to become. Let their firstborn son be the successor. Let a unified dynasty thus be formed. Unity on Nibiru forever to establish. They, they set up a fucking monarchy is what they did. You know, they set up the new game. Who's going to run the new game? They wipe everybody out, and then they set up a new game under that. And the people 100, 200, 300 years from now have no idea why life is the way it is, and nobody really questions it, and people just going around their, about their business Forgetting that two, three hundred thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, everybody died and somebody came in and set up the new game that they controlled. And people just think it's day to day and they never know what happened. You see what happened to us? The same thing. They did it here. They did, they did it on their planet. And then they seeded us with the ability to do it again ourselves. We've gone down the same road they are. You know, you see these, we call them vicious cycles. You know, a father is an alcoholic and a wife beater, and so, you know, and then the son grows up and becomes a, a, an alcoholic and a wife beater, and then his son grows up and becomes, and, and you know, it's, just, it's a vicious cycle. But all it takes to break that vicious cycle is one person standing up and saying, no more, not me. I'm not going to be the one that continues that vicious cycle. It ends here. And that's what we have to do as a people, folks. It's our only hope. We have to say, no, we are not going to allow this to play out the way it's played out before. Every person on this planet needs to know this information. We've got to get this out to the people. People need to know that our destiny is going to be death and destruction and the setting up of a new power structure, resetting the game, resetting the table, starting it all over again. And that's exactly what they want to do because that's what their predecessors did. Their gods, the ones that tinkered on earth and created us in this whole thing. But someone can stand up uh, uh, to this eventually and say no more and by God, there's never been a better time than now. It's got to be us. We have to be the ones that say, no, no, no. This vicious cycle ends here. Otherwise, it's going to continue on and on, and that's exactly what the elite want. And I bet they never counted on the fact we'd ever even identify it. But now that we have, it can't be held back anymore. The royal throne into one flesh combined. 
an unbroken line of kingship established, just like they did on earth. <coughs> the first king after peace was made, a warrior of the north he was, a mighty commander. He was true and fair to the people. He was chosen because his degrees were accepted by all of the people. He built a splendid city to live in, uh, and it was called Agade, which meant unity. So see how the, even the title of the city was uniting, you know, bringing everything together, bringing together the new order. For his reign, a royal title he was granted, and it was the celestial one. Um, on, okay, his name was On, and his name On means the celestial one. Uh, he strong-armed people into reestablishing new laws and regulations on the land. He appointed uh, governors for each land and uh, created restoration and reclamation uh, tasks for the people. Of him in the royal annals, thus it was recorded on the lands unified, peace on Nibiru he restored. He restored. He built a new city. The can canals he repaired provided people to the food, and there was abundance in the lands. For his spouse from the south, a maiden he had chosen for both love and warring, she was known. On two was her royal title. Cute, on two, T-U, like number two. And uh, the leader who is on spouse, the given name cleverly did mean, yeah, on two. <laughs> yeah, it even says, you know, oh, it's clever. It was cute that they did that. She bore on three sons and no daughters. The first born by her named An Ki. An Ki. You see, like An Nu Na Ki. Now it's just An Ki. Now you're starting to see the lineage. See this? That's what this is. That's why he said, you know, this is the preface. This is of the times that came before. Well, that's what we're reading here. This is, this is unbelievable. This is a, an account. I didn't know this. I wasn't aware of this. Wow. It's mind blowing now that I'm reading this. Now that I figured out what this this is, wow, man, this is this is killer. This is a, this is a genealogical record of the generations of uh, people that that came before what we know as the Anunnaki. This is the record of their lineage and of their lives and of what they did. In this, so this the reason this is important to us. Now this is this is amazing, you know. <sighs> I mean, people, you know, say a lot of crap about these, you know, translations and stuff, blah, 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 you know. I think a lot of that's disinfo. I think people are, a lot of people are like, oh, no, those aren't real. Those aren't true, you know, blah, blah. I think people are real scared of this. Because what this is doing is, and, and that's why it said, you know, what has happened in the past is important to the future. Because they're showing what the bloodline lineage, the relatives, ancestors of the Anunnaki who came to Earth and seeded life, they're showing what they did in their lives and how they set things up. And by having that access to that knowledge, that's why this was one of the things that Enki wanted mankind to have, this book. He wanted mankind to know this because something in this information was going to be a gift to us to save us from some fate that may be forced upon us by these custodians in the future. So this is unbelievable, man. I mean, this... <laughs> It really, it's a, it is a, it's it's a an account of the bloodlines of the lineage, you know, and it talks about what they did in their times, and this is something we can learn from, especially when we see how you know this man against man, brother against brother fighting, and then the new order comes in. This was these were this information and stuff we were are supposed to know to learn something from it to keep ourselves from going down the same route that people before us did. That, that's why this has been hidden from us. That's why they've, you know, gone into Iraq, gone into all of the museums and, and taken all these things. They don't want us to get us, our hands on this because if we get our hands on this stuff and understand that what happened in the past also may happen in the future if we don't learn what happened in the past and learn from that, you know, it's, it, it, again, just a paradigm shift. It all makes sense to me. Now, that's what all this shit's about, man. I, I just it was just kind of strange just reading this. And I, as I was reading this, I realized this is a you know uh, this is a genealogical account. 
so that somebody somewhere someday, you and I now, here in 2011, could gain some perspective or some knowledge from this. This is what, what secret societies, the original purpose of secret societies was. And what they did was they took that, corrupted it, and turned it in, instead of being secret societies to teach us this, they turned it in secret societies are there to keep us from learning this. And only their people who are going to play the game their way and not tell people this are going to be initiated. This is the secret of the secret societies, ladies and gentlemen, right here. You heard it right here on the show. I'm here to tell you right now today. This is it. This is what they've been hiding. This is what they didn't want us to know. These genealogical records of the ancestors of the people who came to earth, the gods who came to earth, this is what they, there's something in here, and we're going to find out because we're going to read all this on air. There is something we're supposed to learn here. Whatever it is and what it all may be, yet I just don't know, but it's something. Alone on the throne, he was seated. Uh, he was supposed to choose a spouse twice, but it got postponed. Some of this stuff I'm not going to read verbatim. I'm just going to kind of give you the, you know, <laughs> kind of just put it into modern day terms. Uh, oh, in, in, in his reign, concubines are brought into the palace. A son to him was not born. Oh, so they brought in bitches for him to bang, essentially. They'll, they'll dumb it down for you. The dynasty thus began with the death of Anki, and uh, there, was no found, there was no offspring. The middle son, though not firstborn, was pronounced the legal heir. So um, fascinating stuff here. And uh, the idea of this, you know, this being the, the genealogical record of the people that came bef before the ones that seeded the bloodlines on Earth, it's fascinating stuff. Because you see, now we know the answers to why mankind has lived in constant warfare. It's in our blood. And just like I talked about last night on the show, if you didn't listen to last night's show, go back and listen to it. All the shows this week, I suggest you listen to. Five shows we got this week, I, I think all of them have been killer. And I'm on fire right now. Even more now, you know. But, um, you know, I was just talking about last night about, you know, realizing that I thought for the longest time that I wasn't working hard enough or I wasn't. And it's not just that. The only thing that's holding back me getting my work out on, on, on a, to a larger scale is, you know, you know, cash, backing. Everything is, you know, you're going to have money to get anything out there now. It's not about talent or anything else. It's about how much money you have to put behind something. But once I realized that, I realized that, it, you know, I don't have to kill myself to do it. Trying to kill myself to do this is not the, the, the solution. You know, it was, it was not a hindrance. It was not a weapon against me anymore. And that's, you know, that's what we have to see this as. Once we're aware of this, yes, you know, we do have it in our blood to be in constant warfare and the rest, but we can change it. Once we're aware of it and we realize that, that that's not the way to go and that's a mistake and that people who exist on other planets even prior to Earth went through this and that people thousands of years ago were trying to get a message to us saying, hey, don't go the way we did. You got it in your blood too because you're of us and you're like us. And since you're so much like us, you're going to go the same route we did and a lot of people are going to die and it's not going to be good. Here's the warning in the elite who set up the priest class, who set up the banking houses, the religions, the power structure, the, the, the crown, the authority, the tyranny, everything, said we can't allow them to know this because we won't be able to rule if they know it. We are pushing the envelope now. I mean, can you feel it? We are in the age of awakening, folks. This is it. All is going to be revealed. It is being revealed right now on this show as you're listening. We are the generation that this stuff has to stop with. We have the information. We have the power. Our task now is to wake the people up from their slumber, and it's time to stop playing nice. I hope you'll send this broadcast to somebody. I hope you'll get it out there when, when it appears on YouTube, when it appears on my, on my archives. Get it out there. Let people hear it, man. Let's, let's do this. God, this is, uh, this is unbelievable. Every day is a new mind-blowing, paradigm-blowing day for me. I mean, every day. You know, and it should be for you, too. If you're staying on top of your research, you're paying attention to stuff like what I do, it will be.
Never give up. Never let up.